Good evening, I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and uh, it's my great pleasure this evening to welcome the Ambassador of France to the United States, Ambassador Jean-David Levite. Uh, Ambassador Levite has probably one of the harder jobs right now in Washington, because as you all know from reading the press, this has not been the easiest period in the long history 225 years or so of Franco-American relations, but I can't think of a more able set of hands in which that task could reside. He is a man with great experience and distinction. All those who knew him in his prior posting, uh, which was as the French permanent representative to the United Nations uh, before he became ambassador to Washington last year, uh, described him as even-handed, impartial, impartial, and fair-minded as he carried out his instructions and properly conducted the business of France. Uh, everybody I know in Washington who has worked with him reports the same. Uh, he is a man with an interesting background and experience. He has worked for not one, but two French presidents. Before his ambassadorial positions, he was a foreign policy assistant to President Chirac. And before that, somewhat earlier in his career, he was foreign policy advisor to President Giscard d'Estaing, who you remember was here on this podium uh, a mere 10 days or so ago. And uh, as we look forward to a gradual improvement in uh, French-American relations, uh, I think we could not be better served than having had uh, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing and Jean-David Levite to move that process forward. So please join me in welcoming to the Kennedy School France's distinguished ambassador to the United States, Jean-David Levite. Thank you very much. Ten months in Washington and still alive. <laughs> I'm delighted to be with you uh, tonight at the Kennedy School of Government in the presence of one of the men I most respect and admire in the United States, uh, Dean Joseph Nye. Let me start with one personal, uh, personal story, 9-11. Uh, on 9-11, I was uh, in my office in New York as the uh, French ambassador to uh, the uh, UN. And I saw from the 44th floor uh, of the skyscraper where our offices are, the destruction of the Twin Towers. Of course, this will remain in my heart for the rest of my days. But if I mention that, it's because I was at that moment the president of the Security Council of, of the United Nations. And my first reaction was, uh, this is worse than Pearl Harbor. The United States will have to react, and there are three possibilities, either alone, or with the coalition of the willing, or with a global coalition. And of course, as a French ambassador, our preference was to build a global coalition and to help the US in doing so. That's why at the French mission we prepared a draft resolution which decided to change the international law on two very important issues. In this draft resolution, we proposed to uh, decide that such an act of international terrorism should be considered as an act of war. And this is very important because this changed the international law and would pave the way, if adopted, to uh, self-defense, either alone or with allies, for the United States. And the second change introduced in international law through this draft resolution was to decide that the uh, 
response coming from the United States could be targeted not only against those who committed these acts, and after all they died, most of them, uh, during uh, the uh, uh, tragedy, but also against the states. The states which offered hospitality, equipment, training, finance for the uh, terrorist networks. This resolution was introduced at the very moment the doors of the UN building were opened again on the day after, the 12th of September, and it was adopted unanimously in one hour. And I propose that to show our solidarity and respect to the American people, for the first time in history, the resolution would not be adopted by raising hands, but by standing, standing in respect for the American people during this tragedy. It was a time when the world was behind America. You remember the title of our uh, daily, Le Monde, we are all Americans. We were all Americans. The situation has changed. Why? In my view, there are two important issues at stake. The first one is this question of terrorism. The American people is at war. In Europe, when you travel, you'll see that we are not at war. We are fully engaged in the fight against terrorist networks. But fight is not war. And this is an important nuance uh, in our minds Frankly, when you travel in Europe, not only in France, throughout Europe, you'll see people don't feel that they are at war. Living in this country, I feel that the American people is fully at war against terrorism. Not only terrorist networks or groups, but terrorism, like communism or other ism in, in the past. The second difference between Europe and uh, the United States is the question of sovereignty. Uh, 50 years ago, we have decided in Europe to build our common destiny through shared sovereignty. And we, we achieved a lot. The uh, best example of shared sovereignty is the euro. 300 million inhabitants in Europe have now uh, in their pockets the euro. So shared sovereignty is a way of life for most Europeans. And when we think of solving problems beyond uh, Europe, we quite naturally think of multilateral solution. Uh, in this country, you don't share sovereignty. You protect the US against any interference from the outside world, which could uh, limit the sovereignty of the US administration and maybe even more, the US Congress. So these are two important differences that we must keep in mind when we think about what happened, especially between Europe and, and the United States. So in this context, let me say one word about Iraq. We said it loud and clear, we didn't see an imminent threat. We didn't see any link between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. We didn't see any stock of arms of mass destruction which could be used uh, right away against uh, Europe or of the United States. And so we were in favor of continuing the peaceful disarmament of Iraq through the UN inspections. So that's number one. But number two, we wanted also to protect the credibility of the UN inspections and the inspections of the IAEA. Because it seems to us that it's very important for the international community to have the possibility to use these inspections as a tool to implement possible solutions. Think of North Korea, think of Iran, maybe tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, we'll need credible UN 
inspections or IAEA inspections. And the third reason why we were against this war is this question of preemption. If you don't see an imminent threat, then it's a war of choice and it's a war of preemption and it could change the international order in a rather important way. Think of other example. If you create a precedent, then you have to agree that others could think of a war of preemption. Maybe India against Pakistan because of Kashmir. Maybe uh, Russia uh, in uh, Central Asia because of terrorist networks, and so on and so forth. So for us, these three reasons explain why we were against the war. But the war is basically over, the main operations, and now what is at stake is huge. What is at stake is not only the future of the Iraqi people, but also the future of the whole Middle East and beyond the future of the relations between the Muslim world and the Western world. And because of that, we will help. As you know, we voted in favor of the last resolution, even if we were not fully in agreement uh, with the text. In fact, we voted the three resolutions on Iraq, which have been proposed by the US after the war. And we have proposed uh, to participate in the training of officers or policemen, because in our view, the first priority now is uh, to train and equip the uh, new Iraqi army and the new Iraqi police. But for that, we'd like to, to see our views, at least in part, taken, taken into account. Maybe we'll discuss what are these views, uh, but I, I would simply say uh, it is important that we have a real dialogue about the future of Iraq between friends and allies. Beyond Iraq, let me say uh, one word about Europe. Uh, I hope we'll discuss tonight Europe. I see in the American press more and more questions about the French view uh, on Europe. Do we want to build a Europe which could be a counterweight to uh, or a rival uh, to the United States of America? Frankly, that is not what we have in mind. As I said, we started uh, building the uh, European Union 50 years ago or more for one good reason. We wanted to put an end once and for all, once and for all, to centuries of wars, uh, mainly but not only between Germany and France, which triggered two world wars. And it was an amazing success. We, we started with steel and coal pooled because guns were made of steel and coal, but we added soon uh, nuclear energy. Then we built a common market and we discovered that if you have a common market, you need a common currency. We didn't create the euro to compete with the dollar, but simply because it was absolutely necessary having a common market to have a common currency. Think about the situation of the US market. If you had 10 currencies, one in Texas, one in California, and so on, it wouldn't work. So we don't have the euro to compete or create difficulties to the dollar, but simply because we have a common market. And I think that a common market and a common currency are good news for the US invested investors. When you want to uh, make deals with European com companies or invest in Europe, it's easier to do it in a common market with only one currency. As President Giscard d'Estaing said a few days ago, we are engaged in uh, creating or preparing a constitution. He's better placed than me to uh, discuss that issue, but again, it's absolutely necessary because having added <coughs> treaties above treaties, it's so complex that nobody understands, and not only in the United States, but also in Europe, how it works. 
we must have simple institutions that everybody understands. As you have a constitution. In a way, we are where you were in Philadelphia in 1787. Now, foreign policy and defense. Yes, we want to achieve a common foreign policy. We failed miserably on Iraq. And it's, it's very strange because the public opinions were united. All over Europe, 80% of the population was against the war. But the government were div divided. We have to do better next time. Is it dangerous for the US? I don't think so. We live in a dangerous world. And if you could have, in Europe, a strong, united partner ready to help, it would be much better than pick and choose. Here and there, 300 soldiers from a Baltic state, uh, 1,000 from uh, Hungary or, or Spain, uh, 3,000 from Italy or whatever. We don't want to build a European defense to compete with the US. We see this European defense in the context of NATO. NATO will remain the cornerstone of our security for the next decade, no doubt about that. And we are engaged in the transformation of the uh, European defense, the uh, NATO institutions, to confront the threats of the new century, terrorism, the proliferation of arms of mass destruction. But we consider that it's very important for the Europeans to do better in terms of, def of defense, to put more money, and to, to pull our resources, and to build a more integrated uh, defense. We started with the Franco-German Brigade. Then we, add, we went to the Eurocore, Germany, France, Spain, few of us. Nobody objected. And then we want to go a bit beyond. And we want also to be in a position to act without the support of NATO when the US is not interested in participating and we don't need NATO. That's exactly what we are doing in Macedonia. That's exactly what we did this summer in the Congo. And when we asked the Americans, do you want to uh, participate in this operation in the Congo, which is key for the future of Central Africa, they said, no, we have other priorities, but please do it. We did it. Was it a problem? Certainly not, but it was very helpful. Let me conclude with a few words on our relations. Yes, we've been through a kind of diplomatic hurricane, a kind of political uh, Isabel. I, I come from Washington and we've been hit hard. And our friendship has been hit hard, uh, not only because we had a disagreement, but also because there was a, a bitter campaign. Uh, I met by chance yesterday uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh, I invited him for lunch because I think we have a lot to discuss. I don't understand why there was so much French bashing. <coughs> it seems to me that in a family uh, you may have disagreement, but that's not a reason to insult each other. In a family of democracies, it seems to me quite natural to discuss as grown-ups as you had in the United States, a real debate before the war. Those against and those in favor. We were against the war, but no reason to insult us because of that. And our friendship, in my view, is a real treasure. As I said, we live in a dangerous world. We are confronted to the same dangerous threats. And we have to stay together. We share the same values. We have the same goals to maintain and develop throughout the world these shared values, uh, freedom, market economy. And uh, my hope is that the storm I mentioned will abate. And the meeting we have tonight, I think it's a golden opportunity to uh, take stock about what happened and look forward look forward to be again hand in hand to confront the dangers of today's world. Thank you very much.
Before we uh, turn to questions from the audience, uh, the idea tonight was to vary the format slightly and to have a brief conversation between me and Jean David, uh, uh, maybe to prime some of the questions we might have from the audience. Uh, but let me, let me say that I always felt when I was in government that uh, France was in the long run with us, but they would always make it difficult for us. And that was, in a sense, uh, a French independence. I mean, there was a, a feeling that uh, France would represent a different view within the family, but it was clear they were within the family. But there were some questions that have arisen by pro-French people uh, in the aftermath of Iraq, which I would wonder to get your views of. One is whether France may have made a tactical mistake uh, in Iraq uh, by essentially taking such a hard position against the US and the UN that it not only it undercut its own soft power in the US, but it also undercut the UN. And yet, in the long run, from France's interest, you need the UN to be able to tame the giant. So to the extent to which, by taking such a strong position, you not only reduced your reputation in the US, you might say tant pis, but uh, reducing the value of the UN, because the UN was hurt by this, you reduced the instrument that France needed. Now, some would say, but we should never have allowed the Americans to run away with the UN. You could never have an attack uh, without a Security Council resolution. But in fact, in Kosovo, you voted for an attack without a Security Council resolution. Is it possible to say that France overplayed its hand this time? Thank you very much for, for this question. First, on, on our relations, let me say that, uh, yes, we were together from the early days of your independence. I was in Yorktown uh, on the 19th of October to celebrate the uh, friendship uh, during this decisive war between uh, George Washington, Lafayette, Rochambeau, de Grasse. You saved us twice last century, and we will never forget. And next year, on D-Day, we will uh, commemorate the 60th anniversary of our liberation. And you wanted France to be a free people. And as a free people, we express our views. Maybe we don't agree ev everywhere and uh, on all issues, but most of the time, we do agree. We are side by side in Afghanistan. We are side by side in the war against terrorism. We have the same views on Iran, on North Korea. We are helping together Africa, and so on. Iraq. You mentioned Kosovo, and you have to know that we didn't want to have the second resolution. When we understood that the decision had been taken in Washington to go to the war in any case, I was instructed by President Chirac to go to the White House, and I met Steve Hadley. And I said, if you have decided to go to war and if your decision is final, don't introduce the second resolution. First, because President Bush said that you don't need it. And if you ask for permission, you contradict your president. Second, because if you introduce it, immediately the council will be split between those against and those in favor. And it will be a disastrous message sent to Saddam Hussein at the worst moment. Divided council. Third, if you don't get the nine votes, uh, then uh, you have a, a real difficulty. So please follow what we did together, that is the Kosovo solution underline that with all the existing resolutions, you have enough authority to go to war. And for years, uh, the legal advisors will argue about the legality of the war. But it will make things easier for everybody. And Steve Hadley told me, this is a very constructive uh, proposal, but we cannot follow it because uh, we have uh, 
decided to table it, not for us, but for Tony Blair. Tony Blair is in a difficult political situation at home. He needs this resolution. And I said, fine, but if, again, you don't get a majority uh, for Blair, it's even worse. And the answer of Steve Hadley was, we have the nine votes. And Russia will abstain. China will abstain. And you'll have to decide what you do. <coughs> And I was very impressed. I sent a telegram to Paris to report word by word what was said. We checked and we didn't see the nine votes. Because six countries were undecided and they remain undecided till the last moment. But the fact is that this resolution had only four votes. <coughs> now, basically, and to go beyond these uh, remarks, I'd say that for the members of the Security Council, we had an impossible choice. Either we were going with the war, supporting the war reluctantly, because it's bad for the UN to stay out. Uh, but how can we approve a war? What was at stake was war or peace. And we were very much against the war. Or we would say no to the war to protect the image of the UN throughout the world. Don't forget public opinions. Throughout the world, the world they were against the war. And what was at stake was the image of the UN as much as the capacity of the UN to play a role. So between the two dangers, we preferred to protect the image of the UN because we thought that the U.S. would need the U.N. after the war. And that's exactly where we are. If you had uh, had only one resolution and you played an important role in creating Resolution 1441, what would France have done? In other words, if the Americans had rested the legitimacy on the previous U.N. resolutions, including 1441, and gone ahead without a second resolution, where would France have come out? Joe, France is not a pacifist country. We participated in the first Gulf War. We have troops in Afghanistan, as we speak, not only in Kabul, but special forces on the border. And we didn't exclude to participate in a war against Saddam Hussein to disarm him forcefully by the use of force. With one condition, the decision was in the hands of the Security Council and not in the hands of one of the members of the Security Council. That's the two-step approach that President Chirac proposed. And we stick, we have decided to stick to, to this uh, position. And when we were in the final days, frankly, we didn't see any reason to participate in a war because the inspections were doing a good job. You have seen on your screens the destruction of the missiles Al Samut 2. Inch by inch, the inspectors were doing a good job in clarifying the ambiguities, the contradictions of the uh, Saddam Hussein uh, position. And so we were in favor of continuing the inspections. It, did, it doesn't mean that it would have been forever. And during the last few days, the question was, <coughs> is it possible to have unanimity on a time frame? We proposed publicly, President Chirac on ABC News and CNN, a time frame squeezed in two months, even one month if the inspectors were to agree, so that the unity of the Council would have been maintained. And after this time this delay of one month or two months, then hopefully the Security Council would have been together. There's a larger question which you alluded to in your uh, description of the role of Europe and France's role there, which is how do you handle the United States at this point in history? The U.S. has preponderant military power. It's very unlikely that in a decade anyone will equal American military power might be good, might be bad, but it's a fact of life. President Chirac 
often refers to the necessity of multipolarity, which implies a model like the 19th century where you have equal powers balancing each other. Uh, sometimes said that there's an alternative view, which Blair represents, which is not multipolarity, but multilateralism. The US giant is there, for better or worse, best to try to tame it by keeping it within an institutional framework. But when you try to balance it in the classical multipolar sense, all you do is alienate it and make the problem more difficult. Is that an accurate description of the two European models of how to deal with this uncomfortable giant? And if so, uh, why urge multipolarity if it seems to be impossible within the next decade? Well, I had this discussion. I'm smiling because I had this discussion with Condi Rice three times already. I didn't convince her. But <laughs> I used the best arguments. I said, look in the last book of Dean Joseph Nye, <laughs> and you will see <laughs> that he described the world in very simple terms. In economic terms, you correct me if I'm wrong, the world is already multipolar. You have the US, you have the EU, you have China emerging as a strong partner, Japan, tomorrow India, maybe Brazil or the Mercosur. So the world is already multipolar in economic terms. Is it provocative to say that? No, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. In military terms, the world is unipolar. Is it a problem for us? No. We live in a dangerous world, and thank God the military might of the US is there. What we want to do is to build, not a counterweight in Europe, but a defense, a European defense, which will help us in Europe to take care of the crisis in which most of the time the US will not be involved because simply you don't want to be involved. You mentioned, Joe, Kosovo. I was the diplomatic advisor of President Chirac. Let me say that we Europeans, Blair and Chirac, wanted to act because we could not accept ethnic cleansing in Europe. But President Clinton was not at all enthusiastic, not at all, because considered from Washington, this was not a priority. We must be in a position to deal with the crisis next door for us, even when the US doesn't want to be involved. That's our goal. But for the decades to come, yes, in military terms, the world will remain unipolar, and this is not a problem for us. And for global issues, says Dean Joseph Nye, <laughs> we need multilateral institutions for global warming, AIDS, SARS, uh, WTO for trade, and so on and so forth. And so in our view, and that's what we have in mind, we are already living in a multipolar world in economic terms. Probably in few decades, this will be the situation in political terms. And we certainly need good, strong international institutions to help us solve the global problems of our world. Well, it's hard for me to disagree with that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a little bit about um, the repair of the damage that you've been engaged in. You mentioned to me that you've started a, a French caucus within the Congress. Tell us a little bit about how you did that and what reception you've had and what do you expect it to do? I was very surprised when I discover, discovered that we had, for probably two centuries, in our National Assembly and in our Senate, friendship groups, French-American friendship groups. And they are by far the most important. In the Senate, one third of the members of our Senate are members of this friendship group with the United States. But in the Congress, no group devoted to the friendship between the US and France. You have one for the UK, one for Germany, one for Japan, Brazil, one for 
Sweden, Norway, uh, Switzerland, not for France. And in difficult times, it's very important to be in a position to have an organized dialogue, not only between the governments, but also between the parliaments. They play a very active role. So we've been in touch with members of both houses. And of course, uh, when I started, <coughs> they were quite reluctant. Uh, but after second thoughts, they were positive. And they were positive simply because we need to go beyond this storm I mentioned. We need to work together on all issues, including Iraq, as I said. And it's, it's good news to see that even the representative, uh, Representative Nye, who introduced on the menu of the Congress the Freedom Fries, is a member of the Friendship uh, Caucus uh, devoted to uh, the friendship between uh, France and, and the US. Well, that's progress. But uh, about four months ago, you made a statement uh, that you were dismayed that in addition to the real differences on policy between France and the United States, there are a lot of reports that were circulating which were attributing to France things that were not France's position and that, were, that looked like disinformation or, uh, in simple language, lies. Uh, did you ever get a response to that? And where do you think that was coming from? You guess. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think that was part of, of my problems. That is, day after day, they were uh, in the media, as you said, uh, lies. For instance, the last one uh, was uh, after the fall of Baghdad, uh, in the press reports coming from the Pentagon about the fact that French officials in Baghdad had given French passports to Saddam Hussein, the sons of Saddam Hussein, and the uh, family and supporters of, of Saddam Hussein. But this followed uh, dozens of other disinformation uh, uh, campaign. Uh, and my problem was that each time there were such lies, I was sending in the press uh, letters, and, but they, they were not printed. And so I took the quite unusual initiative uh, to send a public letter uh, to the White House, to the uh, administration, to uh, the members of the Congress, to uh, the boards of all media, to say, stop. Stop because this is dangerous. Stop because the war is over and we have better things to do than engage in this kind of campaign of disinformation. Because what you are doing is destroy the image of France and it's dangerous because it fuels also resentment in France and it could trigger anti-American feelings which didn't exist in France. So please stop and let's work together. And uh, I put in an annex eight examples of disinformation. For instance, we had stocks of smallpox to uh, infect the whole world uh, with this disease uh, from France. Uh, we delivered arms uh, to uh, Baghdad on the very last uh, moment and so on and so forth. All these were lies. And the fact is that this disinformation campaign stopped one day after the letter was received by everybody. Sounds like a clever job of a diplomat doing this. Very well done. Well, it was a dangerous move because mm. uh, when you target both the administration and the, the media at the same time, uh, you, this is a very risky move. Uh, but the eight examples were so obvious that, frankly, uh, I think it, the, the, mes the message was well understood. And let me say that the letter was well received everywhere. Uh, and the members of the Congress, and it was a turning point for me with the caucus, said, you're right, and we have to be fair play. We had a disagreement, but that's not a reason to, uh, to uh, be unfair. 
And so I must attribute to the fair play of my interlocutors. Finally, before we turn to the audience, one last uh, question. Let's discuss a little bit the question of anti-Americanism in France that you just referred to. Uh, after the famous Le Monde headline, there have now been articles that say, uh, nous ne sommes pas tous Américains. And uh, there have also been bestsellers blaming the collapse or 9-11 uh, and the attack on the towers as a plot that was done by Americans. And that crazy views are printed is typical of any country, but that it becomes a bestseller is not necessarily typical. So there are some things which are used to argue that there's a deep anti-Americanism in France. On the other hand, what strikes me is that there's also an anti-anti-Americanism in France. There has grown up a strand in French debate which says, we're making grave mistakes by being so simplistically anti-American. If one looks at the United States, an anti-French feeling in the United States, do you see anything like this? Obviously, there's been a reaction uh, against France because of the war, but I haven't seen much of a reaction against the reaction. So the question would be, which is more prevalent or more deeply rooted or more difficult to manage right now, anti-Americanism in France or anti-French sentiment in the US? Difficult question. I would say, and for those who were in France during the last few months, you will correct or you will complement what I will say. First, the French were 80% against the war. But as I said, this is not particular to France. This was the view all over Europe and beyond and beyond. And because the French were against the war, they were against the policy of President Bush. That's for sure. But it doesn't mean that the French were against the American people because the Americans are Americans. And in my view, that is the main difference between what we've seen in France and what we've seen in this country. I mentioned Bill O'Reilly and I want to invite him for a lunch because I think that he behaved very badly. Uh, when you are the anchor of the number one network in the United States of America and you insult France one hour a day, this is dangerous. I listed three pages of insults which were used by uh, Bill O'Reilly and few others. And I went to uh, the office of uh, Colin Powell. And I said, Mr. Secretary, could you read these three pages of insults? They were on the air or in the media uh, only during the last eight days. So he read the text and he said, forget about it. This is not important. And I said, this is important. This is important for two reasons. You have in the US 300,000 French people. And the fact is that in some schools, American schools, now uh, the little kids from France are insulted. But beyond that, think of these insults if they were addressed to the African-American community in this country or to the Jewish community in this country. What would you say? It would be an outrage. But when it is addressed to the French people, Everybody laughs, and this is a kind of racism. You don't find in France racism against the American people. We have only good feelings for the American people. And you will see again, as I mentioned, next June, on the 6th of June, on the uh, anniversary, the 60th anniversary of D-Day, we will say from the bottom of our hearts again, Thank you, America. Well, thank you very much for those answers. Let's throw it open now to the audience. We have two microphones on the floor, two in the balconies. As always, I'll ask you to keep your questions short, to the point, one per customer, and please <coughs> identify yourself uh, and your relation to the university uh, before you speak. So, Hi, I'm Johan Plessner. I study here at the school. 
Um, I'd like to inquire about another, one of the reasons that I believe causes uh, anti-French resentment. And it's uh, in the past uh, few years, the number of uh, attacks against Jews in France has gone up dramatically. <coughs> and there's a strong sense that uh, not much or little is being done by the French authorities to prevent it. And, my and obviously it causes resentment to many people, me among them. And my question is, how would you respond to that? And is there any reason for optimism for us non-French in this regard? If you look at the polls, you will see that the French are not an anti-Semitic uh, country or people. Uh, the latest polls show, on the country, a growing tendency to uh, have positive feelings about the Jewish community. Uh, it was 72% uh, 10 years ago, it's now 85% today. And I think that is the trend, growing and massive positive feelings. But we have two privileges. We have, in Europe, the most important Jewish community probably 700 or 800,000 people. We don't know exactly because it's forbidden by law in France to ask what is your religion. We have a strict separation between religion and state. But we have also the privilege of having the most important Muslim community, probably four to five millions, eight percent of the population. And this population the second generation, what we call the Burr, have difficulties to integrate in the uh, society, in our society. When they go to school, they have to behave as good French citizens. When they go home, they are under the influence of their parents to follow very strictly the religious uh, rules. And they look at Al Jazeera day after day. And with the Intifada, there was a lot of emotion in our suburbs where they live. And it's true that there were a number of anti Semitic acts for, from these young Burr against Jewish establishment. Not only against Jewish establishment, against also any form of law and order institutions. Police firemen, and so on and so forth. This was not acceptable. And the moment the election were over, and President Chirac was re-elected, a new government was established, President Chirac said, my first priority is to restore law and order in the suburbs. And the first priority among this first priority is to protect the Jewish establishments and the Jewish community. And it was an amazing success. The principle from uh, Maya Giuliani in New York was zero tolerance. But beyond the massive uh, use of force, uh, policemen, gendarmerie in our suburbs, we also adopted in the parliament a law, which is law Lelouch, unanimously adopted, to double the punishment when an act of violence is committed because of racism, anti-Semitism. <coughs> Not only anti-Semitism, but if somebody acts against a Muslim, because he's a Muslim, and this is even more frequent than the acts against the Jewish community, the uh, decision by the judge is to double the punishment. So this is a very tough law, and it's been implemented in the most expeditious way. It is such a success that the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles has decided to give the award of Man of the Year to Nicolas Sarkozy, our minister in charge of the interior, and it was given a few months ago, last spring, uh, in Paris. Was the Loire Lelouch named after Pierre Lelouch? Yes, he's Pierre Lelouch. Pierre Lelouch, who was once here at the Kennedy School. Absolutely. <laughs> In the balcony. <laughs> my, my name is Matt Beckwith. I'm a graduate student here at the Kennedy School. I, had, I spent this past summer in, in France, and I didn't witness any acts of anti-Americanism. However, I did notice uh, some poor, or witness some horrifying acts of dis disenfranchisement by France's Muslim community, particularly the Iranians. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, what role does France's domestic 
Muslim community play in its development and exercise of foreign policy? I said that 80% of the French population was against the war. And the Muslim population represents 8%. This means that 72% of the French population beyond the Muslim community was against the war. So really, the Muslim community or the Jewish community is not a factor. And I must say we don't have the same tradition of communities playing a role uh, in our foreign policy. We don't have uh, Jewish organizations playing a role uh, in favor of this party or against that party and so on. This is not part of our tradition. The religious factor does not exist. Uh, but, uh, of course, we have to keep in mind that we have a real proximity with Arab countries. We were very present in the Maghreb countries for a long, long period. We have for centuries maintained very close relations with the Arab countries, that's a fact. But we want also to maintain the best relations with Israel, and we want to be an actor in the Middle East peace process. Uh, and we think that if we could ha act as Europe, uh, it would be even better. And we are not too bad on this issue. We were miserably failing on Iraq, as I mentioned. But on the Middle East peace process, we have quite a common view. And we are, as such, the European Union, part of the quartet. The Middle East peace process is in the situation you know, uh, but uh, we have no option but to try again and help. Now, you mentioned the Iranian community. We had a problem last summer when you, you were in France uh, with uh, Masoud Rajavi and Miriam Rajavi. Rajavi the Rajavist, uh, the uh, Mujahideen Kalk, are a terrorist organization. They are listed as a terrorist group in Europe and in the United States of America. And you had a number of followers of this group in France. And because we offer hospitality, a number of them have even a French nationality. But we wanted to curb this group. And now we have a judiciary process on the way uh, to take care of this problem. And that's probably why uh, the Iranian community in France was in a sensitive situation at that moment. A right balcony. My name is Phyllis Maloney. I'm an undergraduate at the college. Could you please explain France's legal justification for attempting to block um, the um, removal of sanctions against Libya this summer based on the Lockerbie settlement? Yes. You have to know that there were two planes dis uh, destroyed by Gaddafi and, and Libya. One was the plane destroyed in Lockerbie, and another one was destroyed in Africa. It was a French plane. In the French plane, you had 17 nationalities represented. Most of them were African, a minority French, and you had also six American families in this, fr in this plane. What we wanted is a fair treatment for both. Of course, we supported the deal which was adopted between uh, the US or US lo lawyers and Gaddafi and uh, the foundation working for Gaddafi. It's a good deal and we supported it. But we wanted not to rush in lifting the sanctions in the Security Council because we wanted to give enough time for a good deal same kind of, uh, I would say, uh, compensation given to the families which were uh, the families of those who died in the other plane. That was what we wanted and that's what we got. It is still debated for the second plane. The first deal is done. The second one is not completely uh, closed, uh, signed. But we are hopeful that in the coming days and weeks 
it will be uh, it will be signed also with the kind of same amount of money given to the families of both planes because a life is a life and there was morally something difficult to accept uh, to see some families because they were in one plane receiving a lot of money and the other families because they were in the other planes or their, their family members were in the other planes uh, getting less money and because we had a deal before the amount of money was not the same. So what we wanted is to be fair with all families of the victims of the two planes. So we asked for a delay. It was accepted. It was a success. Gaddafi accepted to negotiate, which was refused before. And we hope for a closure of the second case in the coming days and weeks. This microphone. <coughs> Um, hi, my name is Peter Mraz, and I'm an international student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, I just have a general question on the enlargement of the European Union. What do you think uh, is going to be the effect of that enlargement on the creation of the European foreign and security policy, especially in relation to the United States? It is a, a very good question, because next spring we will add 10 newcomers to the 15 members of the family. And the 10 newcomers have in mind the situation uh, of countries occupied by Soviet Union only 12 or 13 years ago. And of course, for them, security is key. Even if Russia, in our view, is not anymore a threat, they still feel the threat because it's still in their minds. And of course, for them, NATO and the US is the ultimate protector. Will this perception change a lot in the life of the European Union, especially in terms of foreign policy? I don't think so. I don't think so simply because the situation is very simple in the European Union. Either on foreign policy issues we agree with the US and we have a common position inside the European Union. That's the situation on most issues. I mentioned Iran, I could mention Africa or North Korea or Afghanistan. We have a common position. Even on the Middle East peace process, most of the time we have a common position. When some countries in the European Union have a strong different view compared with the view of the US, then immediately you have a split inside the European family, already there with 15 members, between those who are in favor of the US view and those who are against. And this situation will be aggravated by uh, the uh, enlargement. Will it last forever? I don't think so. Simply, foreign policy is the most difficult issue that we will have to address in the coming years and decades for one good reason. We come from very different horizons. In terms of language, we don't have the same languages. In terms of histories, in terms of culture, in terms of traditions. And so it will be very difficult to converge but we are not so bad after all because as I said most of the time we are of the same view and we share this view with the US which shows that the transatlantic divide after all is not the rule of the game. Uh, most of the time we do agree with the US on foreign policy issues. Thank God. This microphone. Good evening. My name is Deanne Divis. I'm a science journalism fellow based at MIT and taking classes also here at the Kennedy School. You mentioned uh, in your discussion earlier this evening that one of the bits of incorrect information that had been spread was that France had large stocks of the smallpox. I'd like if you could please to describe some of the bioterrorism defense efforts that France may be engaged in and if anywhere France either has domestically or in French, French supported programs any amount of the smallpox virus. 
we, as I said, we don't have a stock of smallpox. That's a choice. But we have stocks of vaccines, as you do, and you are producing a lot of vaccines. Uh, we have the same policy, that is, it's better to inject this vaccine uh, to some part of our populations, the doctors, the nurses, and those who would have to take care of an emergency situation if, if there, was, there were an epidemic of smallpox. I must recognize that you and us have not been very successful in implementing this limited policy of protection of uh, these uh, elements of the population. Uh, but that is our response to this risk. This risk. Um, I was in New York when we had the anthrax crisis immediately after 9-11, and frankly for the morale of the population, I would say anthrax was even worse than uh, the uh, terrorist acts against the Twin Towers, because uh, it was there and we didn't know what to do. Uh, in my office, we had one man in charge of opening all the letters, calling the FBI in, when we had doubts, taking huge precautions and so on, and it lasted weeks. And only two or three or four people died because of that. But you imagine what could be the situation. So you have, and we have, in Europe to take a number of precautions to deal with these problems, and that's exactly what our governments <laughs> together, together are doing. Uh, it is a very slow process uh, because uh, it's not easy to change our minds and our uh, <coughs> family lives because of possible but remote threats. Uh, we have to prepare for the the next war, but uh, it's difficult to convince the population that this is necessary. Of course, you are at war, uh, I said it, uh, because of 9-11, and you have changed everything in the airports, for instance, for security and so on. And because you are at war for this war, you prepare the next war against terrorism, this kind of terrorism. But chemical and biological weapons is very difficult to uh, prepare the whole population against it. We know it in Europe, you know it, or those who have to act know it in America, but we are working hand in hand to do whatever possible to prevent this kind of uh, epidemics. That's part me. Hi, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Amy Horowitz from Boston University's Daily Free Press. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, prior to the war, the UN wanted to protect the credibility of the UN inspectors. Um, but several media commentators have stated or suggested that uh, UN inspectors have proved ineffective on numerous accounts, including uh, leaving in 91 and succumbing to intimidation tactics, such as attacks on UN, UN stations in Iraq. Also, a lot of UN inspectors aren't trained in using weaponry, which is uh, believed to be necessary to penetrate sensitive areas. Uh, is it possible that the UN inspectors discredited themselves by being ill-prepared and timid? And does the U is the UN doing anything to strengthen uh, their capabilities? <coughs> First, it seems to me that the UN inspections did quite a good job in Iraq. Uh, it's a fact accepted by uh, the US administration that the inspectors destroyed more arms of mass destruction than the first Gulf War itself. That's a fact. They worked in Iraq between 1991 and 1998. Then they left. When they came back, there were suspicions. And Saddam Hussein said, we have destroyed what was left. But there were contradictions with what we knew. And what we wanted through the UN inspections was as I said, to clarify the ambiguities, the contradictions, and to have a clear understanding of what existed and what was done. Was it mission impossible? I don't think so. For nuclear, which is big, 
the IAEA said, and with quite confidence, quite good confidence, that there was no actual program of rebuilding nuclear bombs. Second, for the missiles, again, it's quite big, and the UN inspectors said that they were quite confident that there was no huge programs on the way to build long-range missiles going beyond the ceiling of 150 kilometers which existed. And Hans Blix decided that the Alsamut 2 missiles that I mentioned, which were going a bit beyond the ceiling of 150 kilometers, 160 or 70 kilometers, should be destroyed. And the Iraqi accepted to destroy these missiles, the whole category, and the army, the Iraqi army, did that. So what was the most difficult task was to find the chemical and biological weapons or clarify the ambiguities. Was it mission impossible? I don't think so. I don't think so, and we had a method. The method was, for instance, on trucks. There were stocks. Saddam Hussein said, we destroyed the stocks. Fine. Where? Where the stocks were destroyed. Here, OK, we send the inspectors were device, with devices to dig in the ground and check if there were traces of anthrax. If there were traces of anthrax, it proved that, yes, there were destructions. How much? Let's try and see through the traces what was the amount destroyed. In parallel, the idea was to have interviews one by one with the 83 scientists in Iraq who had participated, according to Iraq, to these destructions. If there were no contradictions between these uh, testimonies and if there were clear uh, elements of anthrax in the ground, then probably, yes, it was true. If, on the contrary, there were contradictions and no traces, then Saddam Hussein lied. There were stocks. Where are the stocks? And so on and so forth. So this was the method. And France made a number of proposals to improve the capacity of the UN inspections to work more expeditiously and with more results, to double or triple the number of inspectors. It was possible because we had a roster of inspectors available uh, to give them more devices and so on and so forth, to have even more intrusive, intrusive inspections. So it was a possibility. And frankly, now America has deployed throughout Iraq and with all the capacities of a country without Saddam Hussein and his regime, probably 10 times as much inspectors, as many inspectors than the UN had deployed before the war, and with no better results. And frankly, I would argue that it would be better for the US now to invite again the UN inspectors, because these guys are first good scientists, Second, they have devoted years of their professional lives to the situation in Iraq in terms of arms of mass destruction. They know. They know what are the questions to ask. They know where the, the stocks were and so on and so forth. So why is it impossible to invite them? They could help. They are available. Uh, and I said, Joe, it's very important to maintain the credibility of the inspections, because you know that three foreign ministers from France, Germany, and the UK visited Iran a few days ago, and they obtained, they obtained three things. First, an engagement from Iran to sign the <coughs> protocol which will allow, if implemented, the IAEA to send inspectors beyond what the NTP provides. Second, an engagement of full transparency, clarity, what happened in the past and what is happening now. And third, an engagement of suspension 
of the enrichment of uh, uranium uh, in Natanz and elsewhere if necessary. These are important developments, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Now we have to go in Iran and with the IAEA inspectors to see what is happening. And the credibility of these inspections is key for the future. And if we could send someday in North Korea inspectors with the capacities the inspectors had in Iraq, thanks to Resolution 1441, that is to open all the doors or of all the palaces of Kim Jong-il, to go everywhere in the country, day and night, seven days a week, well, it would be a, quite an achievement. So the credi credibility of the inspections as a tool in the hands of the international community, for us, is very important. Uh, <coughs> we've basically run out of time, but if you're quick, we'll squeeze in one more question. Thank you very much. My name is Kendall Wolf. I'm a student at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Uh, Ambassador, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned France's troops in Afghanistan, in Kabul, and on the border. And I was wondering if you could further expound on the French role in the war on terrorism and how this role could, uh, how this cooperative role could lead to an improvement in transatlantic relations. When I presented my credentials to uh, President Bush on December 9, uh, he told me three things. Uh, first, congratulations for what you achieved with Resolution 1441 with John Negroponte, the U.S. ambassadors and the other members of the Council. Uh, since then, uh, the uh, situation has deteriorated steadily, but it was a, a happy moment. Uh, second, I consider France our best ally in the war against terrorism. Third, he told me, you have the best residents and cook in town. And I said, President, <laughs> President come back soon. Uh, and I hope he will come someday. Uh, but on the second thing, I think he's right. France is, in my view, the best ally of the US in the war against terrorism. Uh, for one good reason, we had a lot of uh, tragedies in France because of Islamist terrorism. Uh, there was a civil war in Algeria, and in the 80s and mid-90s, we had in our streets, in our subway system, uh, a number of explosions, terrorist acts, which killed dozens and dozens of French people. And since then, we have special judges in charge of destroying these terrorist networks. So we have accum accumulated a lot of experience about these networks. And we share this intelligence day after day without reservation with our American friends. And we suffered a lot from Al-Qaeda. 10 French people, 11 French people were killed in Karachi because we are helping the Pakistani army. Four French people died in Casablanca when there was these uh, terrorist acts in Casablanca. And we had a, a, a tanker, an oil tanker, dist nearly destroyed off the coast of Yemen because of a terrorist attack by Al-Qaeda. So we share all this intelligence. And yes, I think we are uh, the best ally of the US in this war. And I say a war. And we are in Afghanistan. We participated in the war in Afghanistan with 5,000 troops, with the aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle, with 100 planes. And we still have troops, as I said, deployed in Kabul and in uh, special forces on the border. And it's very important that we succeed in Afghanistan as well as in Iraq. And frankly, the situation in uh, Afghanistan uh, now is, is very, very difficult because the Taliban are trying to uh, rebuild their strength in the area on both sides of the border. And it's very important that we succeed together in destroying 
these uh, networks uh, because otherwise they will slowly regain control of the Pashtun area in the southeast and the south of uh, Afghanistan. And the Pashtuns represent the relative majority in Afghanistan. So we are fully engaged in Afghanistan. We are fully engaged in sharing all intelligence that we have. We are fully engaged also elsewhere because it is a global fight against uh, all the terrorist networks. And this fight, and again I say fight now because it's not only a war in Afghanistan, it is a fight which has a military aspect, that's for sure, but not only. You will not win against the terrorist networks only through military means. That is our conviction. And this conviction is shared. And that's why I mentioned when I, I took the floor in my introductory remarks that we want, we must build a global coalition. We must fight with military means when necessary, but beyond. This global coalition will have to take care of the financing of the terrorist networks. This global coalition will have to take care of the legal aspects. Uh, we have to change our laws to be more efficient together. We have to do a better job on our borders. We have to do a better job also in our airports and so on and so forth. So it's a global coalition that must be maintained with all the elements of a global policy to slowly destroy the possibilities for terrorist groups to destroy our freedom, freedoms, our societies, and not only the Western societies, but also the Islamic societies and beyond. It is a global threat. And as Dean Joseph Nye say in his last book, or the book before the last, uh, confronted with a global threat, we must have global institutions, multilateral institutions, and that's what I did my best to achieve in this important month of September 2001 with Resolution 1368, the first, the one adopted on the 12th of September, and 1373, the one adopted on the 29th of September, which is creating a global coalition with a global strategy against terrorism. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time, uh, but I am sure that all of you in the audience who agree with me on the importance of reconstructing the U.S.-French relationship will also agree with me that both France and the United States are fortunate to have such an articulate French ambassador in Washington. So please join me in thanking him. Very good, very good. They would have kept you here all night. <laughs> yeah, I would be delighted to see you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, now we need to get your coat, and we're going over to a building across the courtyard. Okay, we'll do it over dessert, maybe. Okay. As long as you wish. Okay, good. I put All right. <laughs> uh, let me go get your coach, and I'll make you bring you over the Dean, I'll get, I'll get it.